worship the Lord with us this morning.
Jesus paid it all. Let's give him just a clap offering. Yes. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much. Lord, I just stand here in awe and say those words. Jesus paid it all. God, thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you, God. Lord, I also know as I say those words, there's someone here in this room and online that doesn't know what that means. Jesus paid it all. We pray today, God, that they would know, they would accept you and say, thank you, God, for your son, Jesus, paying it all for me. Lord, we just love you. Lord, we also turn and pray for the fires that are burning in Texas. Lord, we know what it's like to see the fire burning. We know what it's like to smell the smoke. And we pray, God, that you will bring relief to them. You'll bring rain. God, you will be provision for what they need for themselves personally and for their animals, God. Lord, we just lift them up to you and pray that you'd be with them. Lord, I pray for us as we go into the next part of our worship by opening your word, hearing your truth. Lord, we say, we invite you to speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So good to see everybody. Hey, before you have a seat, love for you to turn your neighbor and tell them if you had to go get something out of your neighbor's yard that blew over there last night. Well, I didn't have to go get anything, but when the wind woke me up in the middle of the night, I don't even know what time it was, I was mentally thinking, what did I do outside today? What did I leave out there? What is two blocks away right now? So it's part of living in Colorado, right? So welcome. My name is Carrie Stewart. I'm the missions pastor here, and I'm so glad you've joined us. Whether you're in person or you're online, we are so glad that you're with us. There is a connection card in the chair back in front of you, or use the QR code on the screen. The connection card purpose is for you. If you're new, we would love to know more about you, how we can connect with you. But the QR code is also for anybody that wants to know what's happening at Timberland Church. How can I get involved? How can my kids get involved? Please use that QR code for that. I want to say thank you to all who give faithfully through Timberland Church. Your giving makes an impact globally, nationally, and locally. As we were praying for the fires that are burning in Texas, I want you to know when you give through Timberline Church, you're giving through Timberline to our partner, Convoy of Hope, who is present right now in Texas with needed resources. So I want you to know that's the kind of impact you have when you give. You can give online. You can give um, 
we have a box at the back and also through our app. There's many ways for you to do that, and we'll just say thank you. Before Pastor Jeff comes to give us the message, there's a couple things I'm excited to share with you about. Grandparents, if you have grandkids ages 6 to 12, Wednesday, March 13th, we're going to have an event here at Tamerlane Church for you. It's going to be a time of doing crafts, worshiping, hearing stories, just making great memories together. It's $25 a person, but that includes your meal also. So I encourage you to register through that QR code I mentioned before or on our website. And I want you to know every year, every year, we fill this room with kids for vacation Bible school. It's amazing to fill this up. I want you to know as a staff, we love the hum of the kids. It's just amazing the energy that they bring in. And it's not like you can even understand what they're saying. It's just this hum buzz that goes through. We're so excited. But it takes volunteers like you, like you, to say, hey, I will give my time that week to serve in vacation Bible school in whatever capacity. You have lots of options to choose from. But when you exit out the door right to the right, you'll see a VBS sign kind of flashing. Make your way that way and go sign up or also down by Timber Kids. You know, when these kids come, there's many of them who will have never heard the name of Jesus. And many of them will give their life to the Lord that week through the, just the experience of Vacation Bible School. And we get an invitation to be a part of that. So I encourage you just to be a part. We love having the kids here. I'm looking forward to continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark with Pastor Jeff. Isn't it exciting to think, as we hear about VBS, hundreds, hundreds of perfectly behaved children sitting <laughs> right here. It's going to just be wonderful. Please uh, respond to all that you've heard, both in prayer and, and volunteering. Good morning, Traditions. Lovely to have you with us. And if you're joining us online as well, thank you so much. Wherever you are, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, it's correct. We are continuing this series in Mark's Gospel. We've been in Mark for 14 months now, and we're moving towards the end of the series. And Jesus has been arrested. Um, if you weren't here last week, uh, Dr. Foth did a remarkable job giving us an overview of the specifics of that event. And this weekend, we're continuing to think about this. And the, uh, the title for this message is Moving Beyond Regret. Moving beyond regret. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 14 and verses 66 onwards. It says this, Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, You were one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. Just then, a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, this man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, you must be one of them because you're a Galilean. Peter swore, a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he broke down and 
wept. Just pray with me. Father, as we turn to your word, we open our hearts very intentionally and deliberately to the work of the Holy Spirit. And as we think about moving beyond regret, we pray that you will apply your word to where we are. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Everybody said a little louder. <laughs> it's one of those conversations that uh, often emerges when friends are gathered around at a, a dinner table and maybe the, there's been a lull in the chatter and then someone says, why don't, we, why don't we share some of our most embarrassing moments? And uh, you will know me perhaps well enough to know that when people talk about embarrassing moments and ask me about mine, my initial response is, how long have you got? Because my life is filled with embarrassing moments. I frequently feel like Mr. Bean with a Bible. One after another, one of my favorites, I've mentioned it here before, uh, happened years ago when I was uh, walking into uh, the church uh, location where we were at the time. And Sue was just ahead of me. Sue had been hugely and humongously pregnant for nine months. I mean, I just thought, she's, there's, a, there's a small group in there. It's just remarkable. And uh, it did seem to me that she still looked about the same size, but she was pushing a stroller. We call it a pram or whatever you call those things that you carry babies in. What do you carry a baby in, Mac? That's the one, stroller. And uh, that should have been a hint, but I, I didn't get the hint. And I said, hi, Sue, no baby yet then. <laughs> and she turned to me and she pointed at the newborn child. And she said, what do you think that is, a fish? <laughs> and she slapped my face and stomped on my foot. I said, you should be ashamed of yourself. You're so thoughtless. <laughs> no, she didn't. She just laughed out loud. In fact, she called me later that day and said, Hi, Mr. Bean. I, I'm feeling bad for you. It really is okay. We had a good laugh about it. It's one of my most embarrassing moments. There have been many. But what if your most embarrassing moment in life was also, very seriously, your most shameful moment in life? The moment of your deepest darkest failure. And that is exactly what happened to Peter after three years of being with Jesus, being in the inner circle with Jesus, together with James and John. And he's confessed that Jesus is the Christ, and he's seen the transfiguration, and he's around when dead people get up, and he's seen blind eyes be opened, and he's professed undying loyalty to Jesus. But now, he repeatedly denies knowing Jesus with curses. And as we look closer at the story, I'd like to suggest that it begins, this episode, with good intentions. And when Jesus was arrested, all of the disciples, including Peter, ran for their lives. There was one young man present who was only wearing, the Bible says, a long linen shirt, and they grabbed him and his, they ripped his shirt off, and the Bible says he ran away naked. That's embarrassing. Commentators and church tradition says that that young man was Mark, who wrote this gospel. No wonder he said a young man was there. You wouldn't want your name necessarily associated with that particular embarrassing moment. Jesus is taken to the home of the high priest. And Peter gathers his wits, and we read, Meanwhile, Peter followed him, followed Jesus at a distance, and went right into the high priest's courtyard. You see, preachers tend to zero immediately on the failure of Peter, but he's the one who actually presses in and goes to the place of greatest danger. The note in the Orthodox Study Bible says Peter denies the Lord, but at least he's there to do so. And it begins well, but it ends with his resolve and his faithfulness crumbling. And here's the question. 
Why? Why? What can we learn? I mean, we, we all fail, don't we? Raise your hand if you've ever failed. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've never made a mistake in your life. Come forward right now. <laughs> what can we learn about failure from this, this story? Well, first of all, let's, have a, let's take a look at a, an anatomy of failure. An anatomy of failure. I would suggest that there were some combining factors, some, a perfect storm, if you will, that ultimately led to Peter denying Jesus. First of all, he's feeling somewhat hopeless about himself because prior to the failure we're about to look at, he'd already failed in the previous couple of hours. First of all, he'd fallen asleep in Gethsemane. Jesus had asked him and the others repeatedly, watch and pray with me. But now we read, he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Notice Jesus specifically speaks to Peter in that moment. So Peter's feeling like at the moment that he needed me, I, I, I was asleep. And then there's the clumsy sword swinging. When they arrest Jesus, what happens? Mark 14, 47, but one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. When we turn to John's gospel, we discover the identity of the sword swinger. It's Peter. Now notice something, which I didn't notice until preparing for this message. The guy who had his ear amputated was the high priest's slave. Who is the woman who challenges Peter? One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by. So these are work colleagues. It's, it's just possible that Peter's thinking, maybe he told her about what be, could be considered as a case of attempted murder, heightening the challenge. But he's messed up. And then thirdly, together with all the others, he had, he'd run away. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. Here's the thing. What we do when we are in the morass of failure really matters. Because when we have failed, we can feel like demotivated. I'm, I'm just rubbish anyway. We're disappointed in ourselves. We feel hopeless. We feel like there's no sense in trying. Well, I'm just a loser. And we suddenly find ourselves feeling like, well, I messed up like this, so I might as well mess up with this. He perhaps felt hopeless about himself. Then there's just the simple blind terror of the moment. I mean, this is, this is an awful scene. He's in the courtyard and above, he surely can hear what's going on with Jesus. Then some of them began to spit at him and they blindfolded him and beat him with their fists. Prophesy to us, they jeered, and the guards slapped him as they took him away. I can remember from high school, watching a fight and recoiling not only at the violence but at the awful sound of a fist colliding with flesh and it's not the, the benign slap of a Hollywood conflict it's an ugly vile abusive sound and Peter's hearing that and I've looked at this story and I thought, I wonder how I would have done. Hearing how they're treating Jesus and thinking, I, I might be next. And there's fear that creates panic. And, and I've already mentioned this, but let's just return to it for a moment. Peter's exhausted because they've had the Last Supper. They've gone to Gethsemane. And as you study the episode carefully, it's probably 2 or 3 a.m. How many know that when you wake up at 2 a.m., you don't see life straight? 
suddenly the shadows become Goliaths. You wake up in the morning and you think, what was I thinking last night? And Peter is exhausted. When we're exhausted, when we're under the influence of weariness, when we're under the influence of anything, that extra glass of wine, that's when we need to be really careful. He's exhausted. And then there's such a lack of self-awareness and there's arrogance with Peter. Peter said to Jesus, even if everyone deserts you, I never will. Jesus replied, tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter declared emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I'll never deny you. And all the others vowed the same. Nobody speaks in the Gospels as much as Peter. No disciple was rebuked like Peter was rebuked, and no disciple felt able to rebuke Jesus like Peter did. He is unaware of his vulnerabilities. Do you know what the most unexplored space in the universe is? The final frontier. It is not Gaia BH1, the black hole, which is 1,500 and 60 light years from Earth. A light year is six trillion miles. So I tried to calculate that, but my calculator just gave up. I just got that thing with the E on the end, and I don't even know what that means. The most unexplored space in the universe is not out there. It is right here. Sometimes I take my grandsons fishing. I don't know why. It's a waste of time. We have never yet caught anything, mainly because I don't know anything about bait. Last time we went, Stanley, turning 15 next week, said, Granddad, why are we using chicken wings for bait? Surely the fish don't like chicken wings. And I said, Probably not, but you never know, they might grow fond of it. <laughs> we have never once caught anything. But here's what we always experience. It's a, it's a bird's nest of fishing line. And it gets tangled up and you've got a knot here and a knot here and a knot here and a knot here. And, and you look at this bird's nest and you, you mutter something like, oh, hallelujah, something like that. And then you untie that knot and you create another knot over there. And you untie that knot and you create another knot over there. And it's just a massive tangle. And in the end, you just cut the line and say, let's go home. Eat the chicken wings. <laughs> that is the inside of our heads. There are 86 billion neurons, each of them with 10,000 connections. There are 100 trillion connections in here. The most unexplored space in the universe is between your ears. And that's why it can be difficult to know ourselves. We need God's help. Now, sometimes he helps us by warning us of problems and temptations ahead. Years ago, when I lived in Oregon, Kay and I were traveling in ministry. We'd go into a different church every week and hold services, teaching services. They, they called it revivals. I always thought that it was interesting that we could schedule a revival and organize that, but that's not important right now. And uh, it's Wednesday night, and I'm in my home church there, and I'm about to go to another church the following weekend. And an elderly lady got up and interrupted the service. Very nicely, kindly, but she said, Pastor, she, the senior pastor was leading the, the service, and she said, Pastor, I, I feel like God's given me a word, a prophetic word for somebody. And she, she came out the front and she said, Jeff, where are you? And I'm like, I'm here. She said, I, I feel like God said something to me that I need to share with you in front of everybody. And I'm like, great. <laughs> and I was hoping for a good prophetic word. You know, God's going to give you a new car, a new house, and a head of hair, something like that. 
And she, she called me out the front, and in front of 250 people, she said, in the next seven days, young man, that made me feel good. She said, in the next seven days, temptation to immorality is coming your way big time. Be ready. If you surrender to it, you will destroy your marriage and your ministry. It's coming next seven days. I drove out of town. Kay was not with me. Went to a church where I was spending four days. And without getting into detail, the moment and the opportunity came to make a disastrous decision. You've kind of gone quiet. Some of you, because this is unusual stuff, and some of you are looking at this face going, man, how did you get that opportunity? I was forewarned about my own potential fragility. God is very kind to me. I think sometimes God says to the angels, bless him, it's Jeffrey. He needs, he needs as much help as we can give him. My point is, often, we don't know our own weaknesses. If we are the people who, when others fail, we say, well, I could never do that, watch yourself. Because a person, a person should watch when they stand, lest they fall. We don't know what we're capable of. Given the right opportunity and pressure, Holy Spirit, show us, us. Secondly, there's the shame that can paralyze us. The shame that can paralyze us. You see, sin is a downhill slide. It's not level ground. This year, Kay and I have officially given up skiing, together with fishing. We took our grandson skiing this summer, and she wasn't well enough to ski, but I was, and I had this romantic notion of skiing with my grandsons, and they're like, <laughs> and granddad's like, <laughs> and I managed to chase after them and got lost and found myself at the top of a double diamond black. And my skiing's not pretty, it's like a downhill stagger. And I'm at the top of this double diamond black thinking, it's steep. Sin, when we consistently give ourselves to it, is a double diamond black. It takes us down. Peter swore a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. Peter's first denial was private and evasive. The second one was evasive and public. The third is direct, public, and strong. He calls down curses on himself. It's getting worse. And that's the way it is. But the result of that is shame. Deep sadness. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he broke down and wept. The verb that Mark uses here for breaking down and weeping means to throw yourself on the floor. He is totally devastated. He's paralyzed by guilt and he's smothered by shame. Now, guilt is not a bad thing. In fact, in our culture today, people seem to be suggesting that to feel guilty about anything is a bad idea. That in itself is a bad idea. If we have no guilt, ultimately, we have a lawless society. Mark Twain said it's good to feel guilty when you are. But there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is targeted, but shame smothers. Guilt says you did something bad. Shame says you are bad. Shame can be irrational, making the victim feel like the perpetrator. Shame doesn't need to have a specific reason to strike. It can just be a general feeling of, I'm just not good enough. Lewis Smedes, who wrote beautifully about shame and guilt, he said, shame is a very heavy feeling. 
It is a feeling that we do not measure up and maybe will never measure up to the sorts of people we're meant to be. The feeling when we're conscious of it gives us a vague disgust with ourselves, which in turn feels like a hunk of lead on our hearts. John Quincy Adams suffered from shame. He said, my life has been spent in vain and ideal aspirations and in ceaseless rejected prayers that something beneficial should be the result of my existence. Oh, really, Mr. Adams, because you were ambassador, US ambassador to Holland, ambassador to Britain, ambassador to Russia, secretary of state, senator, and president of the United States. You see, shame blinds us to anything good that God is doing in our lives, and we define ourselves by our worst moments and we become shame addicts. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Mission. Robert De Niro plays Rodrigo Mendoza. He's a slave owner who killed his brother in a fit of jealous rage. He's grief-stricken. He shuts himself away in a monastery cell and refuses to accept forgiveness. But he agrees as an act of penance to go with a group of Jesuit missionaries on a trip to the Amazon. But he is so consumed with shame, he puts a whole suit of armor into a net bag and drags it behind him. And when they get to the Amazon, they have to climb a perilous waterfall. And one of the Jesuit priests cuts the rope so that Mendoza can climb. But when he gets to the top, he climbs all the way back down again and he reattaches the armor to himself. And some of us do that every week. We get together and we sing our songs about amazing grace. And for a moment the rope is cut and then we get out there and we unconsciously even, attach the rope to ourselves once again. We need to let Jesus cut the rope. Cut the rope. And that leads us thirdly and finally to the grace of Jesus that lifts us up. The grace of Jesus that lifts us up. Look at this. Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. This is Luke's version. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. What's been going on? Jesus has been repeatedly punched in the face. His face is bruised and bloodied. And he looks at Peter he saw what Peter did and he prophesied it in advance, which didn't make Peter the victim of inevitability. He still had his own will to choose. But here's what we read. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind before the rooster crows twice. You would deny three times that you even know me. Peter was utterly known by Jesus and utterly loved by Jesus. You know, many of us have experienced romance. I've talked before about the letters that I sent to Kay when we were dating. They are in a box secure in England. I will never reveal where those letters are. I feel I'm going to be embarrassed after dying if anyone ever finds those. They're so slushy and mushy and quasi-religious. Dear Sister Kay, I think you're really gorgeous. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I really love you, but I love Jesus more. It was a combination of spiritual passion and spiritual neurosis, and it was... It was, it was romance, it was romance, it was romance, and then you get married. And in Hollywood, have you noticed, no one has morning breath. The couple wake up in the morning and they kiss. Yuck! 
and Kay didn't know that I tend to remove clothing and just drop it on the floor. She's learned now to just leave it there, sometimes for decades. I like to say that I didn't know her stuff. I just can't be honest with you. There's really, there's just no stuff with my wife. She's just about perfect. And that's not romance speaking. But she knows the fragile me, and she loves me. Now we have graduated from romance. The, the love that Jesus has for us is not romantic. He knows us. But look at this beautiful thing. It's resurrection time, and Jesus has been raised. And when we go forward to Mark 16, and the, the angel says, now go tell Jesus' disciples, look at this, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead to you, to Galilee. I love that. It's like, don't let Peter say that he's handed in his resignation. Don't let him say, include Peter. How beautiful. And in John 21, I'd love you to read John 21 this week. There's the epic breakfast, a week after the resurrection. It's been a week since they've seen Jesus. They probably wonder where he's gone. And they're out fishing. It's the beach at Tabgar in Galilee, my favorite place when we go to Israel. I love standing on that beach. And there's a guy on the, on the shore, and he's cooking fish and bread. And it's Jesus, but they don't know it's Jesus. Where did he get the fish from and the bread? So he must have gone shopping or fishing. I don't think he just stood by the shore and said, tilapia, come forth. <laughs> He's cooking them breakfast. And it's so beautiful. He, they've not caught anything. He directs them and they have this amazing catch, 153 fish. Someone's counting. That's weird. The resurrected Jesus is right there and someone's on the beach going, 47, 48, 49. It's Peter, excuse me, it's John who figures out that it's Jesus. John always figures it out before Peter and Peter always takes action before John. John says, it is the Lord, splash. Peter's over the side running up the beach. And what's there? There's a fire burning. When was the last time in John's gospel there was a fire burning? It's Peter warming his hands by fire. Same Greek word. What's Jesus up to? Is he tormenting Peter with the memory? I don't think so. I think he's locating himself in Peter's story. Because grace is knowing. Grace doesn't minimize sin, it maximizes the love of God. And he invites Peter to sit down by a fire, but not deny him. Three times he says, do you love me? One for each denial. Because shame silences our worship. It makes us want to back away. Three times he says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Why? Three times. One for each denial. Because shame makes us feel like we could never be useful again. And Peter has to accept grace. And so do we. Two things before I close. One is that sometimes people say to me, Pastor Jeff, I just don't feel forgiven. I'm like, what? What does, it feel, what does it feel like to feel forgiven? Do you get like a little electric shock that goes down your vertebrae? There's no such thing. Accepting grace is like accepting Jesus. It's an act of faith in a fact. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's an act of faith and trust. 
And the second thing is this. On my way to church last night, I listened to the first half of Dr. Foth's message last weekend. And I didn't get to the end because I'd arrived here at Timberline. And I ended the service last night by saying, isn't it wonderful when you get a bill that says paid? Isn't that, isn't that nice? It's better than the red lettering that says final demand. Paid. And we're driving home last night and Kay turned to me and she said, you know what you said at the end, paid? She said, I think you should say paid in full. I said, yeah. So I'm driving here this morning and I decide to listen to the end of Dr. Foth's message. And last weekend, he ended the message with the words, paid in full. I believe the Holy Spirit is turning up the volume because some of us need to hear it repeated. Time to cut the rope or let Jesus do it. Time to finally accept. Paid in full. Tetelestai, the words that Jesus cried from the cross. Paid in full. Jesus paid it all, not, not just a nice traditional hymn. the rock of truth on which we stand. Let's pray together. Lord, as we have taken this look at this fragility, this failure in Peter, Thank you that it, it's recorded for us. Thank you that Peter wanted it to be recorded for us because he's the one who talked to Mark. And the gospel of Mark came as a result. Thank you that Jesus, you have paid it all and in some strange and beautiful way, you're turning the volume up for some of us especially those of us who have a tendency to define ourselves by our worst moments. We know exactly who we are right now. And your intention today is not to accelerate our shame, but rather bring us into your grace. We're going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to stop talking for a, a little while. And I invite us, if we're carrying around that suit of armor of shame, to bring that to Jesus now. Not to repent again, but rather to say, grant me a gift of faith to accept your grace and live in the good of it. Holy Spirit, please take the seeds of God's word produce the good fruit of peace and joy especially for those of us who acutely struggle as our heads are bowed I, I want to give the opportunity as I did last night to invite you if you're not a follower of Jesus to change that and here we are 926 on a Sunday morning in sunny Colorado and this can be the moment where you decide I want to follow that Jesus 
For some of us, we've not done that before because of our horrible histories. And we felt like we couldn't do that. But his grace is for us, for all of us. And so let me be clear. This is a moment for you if you are deciding to become a Christian. That's what this is about. And now you're ready to make the first step. Well, there's a way you can do that. There's a simple prayer that you can pray. Perhaps I can help with that. Sometimes we don't know what to say. So if you'd like to make that step, here's a prayer you can pray. Jesus, here I am. I've heard that you know me. I've heard that you love me. I now choose to respond to your love. I choose to believe that you paid the price. You took my place. You died on the cross. As an act of faith, I choose to believe that you are now alive forever. I invite you to be my Lord, my friend. I turn from my way to yours. Show me now what that means. I choose. Let's just keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I'm the one looking around. If you've just prayed that prayer because you're deciding to follow Christ, can I ask you just to slip up your hand so I can see it and then put it down again? Do it right now, please. You've just decided. Thank you. Thank you. Are there are others. Moment of decision. Thank you. So reveal yourself, your beauty, your grace, your glory to each one we pray. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. And everybody said, I think we applauded the Lord earlier. Could we applaud him again because he is beautiful? So you know this? He paid it all. He paid it all. Stand with me if you're able. And let's declare that truth together. And let's live in that truth this week.
together. I want to encourage you. There are so many nuggets of truth. I want to encourage you the things that resonated in your heart, make note of it. Make note of it. Pastor Jeff cannot read your mind. I want to encourage you that's the Holy Spirit stirring in your heart to pay attention. There's so many great reminders. I love how Pastor Jeff pointed out in scripture that even when Peter made a mistake, Jesus was intentionally said, include him, include him. And Jesus says that about us, include her, include him. If you accepted Christ as your savior today, we truly celebrate with you and we count it an honor to journey with you. We have a packet right up here for you, right on, on the stage on either side. And I wanna encourage you to take this with you. This is just part, helping you in your next steps with Jesus. Our prayer team is up here, and they truly counted an honor to stand in the gap with you, whatever you're going through, just to take a moment before you go and pray. Whatever burden you're carrying, a diagnosis that you've received, a financial challenge, let someone pray with you before you go. You know, as we say frequently around here, let love live. Let love live in our relationships. Let love live in the things we say, those emails we send. So let's say it together before we go. Let love live. God bless you. Go in the joy of the Lord.